Hey ladies and gents, and welcome to the Controlled Interest Gamecast episode 224, where we talk about video games and everything happening in the industry. As always, I'm your host, Jared Weich. This week, there's no Dom. My co-host for this week is a uh, podcast regular over here, Chris Noons, aka Topher Noons. How's it going, Chris? Not too bad. I'm uh, pretty excited after this ID at Xbox. Yeah, a lot of good games. Uh, we'll talk about particularly the presentation of the show, which will be a an interesting conversation there. But in terms of the games shown, which are the most important part of these presentations, some really stellar stuff. Um, just a heads up, the way we're going to be covering it is we're not going to be going over it game by game. I figured we would bring the games that kind of spoke to us the most and kind of have a conversation around those um, and kind of feel out why we like them, what's interesting about them. Maybe it's the devs, maybe it's the art style, maybe it's the gameplay mechanics that they showcased. And we'll go through it that way. But before we do that, we got plenty of quickie news to go over and uh, a couple of games I played this week that we'll cover at the end of the show, too. I'm wondering maybe if you have anything to talk about, Chris. But until yeah. then, uh, let's get to the rundown. So first up, a Katana Zero update. Uh, people who have listened to the podcast know Katana Zero is one of my favorite games. I love ASCII software, the developers, one guy named Justin. Uh, he gave a development uh, update this week regarding the DLC that was coming out for Katana Zero. And... It's pretty likely that most people that enjoy this game probably didn't know it was getting DLC. As much as I love this game, I didn't know it was getting DLC. And the really awesome part about it is uh, he's been working on this on his own. And very much like Hollow Knight Silk Song and probably the Delicious Last Course for Cuphead, when these developers make these DLCs, they tend to make them a lot larger than they originally anticipated, Chris. And it's the same thing with Katana Zero. Uh, he said now it's a bit over half the size of the main game. It's going to be completely free, which is awesome. He's not charging for the DLC. It's just going to be bonus content there, which is really cool. Uh, there's no release date yet, but I figured I'd provide this update for people because I didn't know this game was getting DLC. Um, you know, we'll talk about this later in terms of the presentation for ID at Xbox, but it's kind of, you know, we expect DLC from these AAA developers, right, Chris? Because they have these large studios, they're working on these games, there's a big budget. They want to have a tail to their games in terms of profit moving forward after the game is released. With indie games, however, it's kind of like a bonus gift. Like You shouldn't expect or anticipate DLC because it's hard enough for these guys to make these games with the limited budgets. Um, so it's really dope to see. Uh, Chris, did you ever get around to trying out Katana Zero? Are you familiar with the game at all? Familiar with the game. Um, played it at a PAX East um, oh, cool. and got to, got to try it early, so it was pretty awesome. Uh, I enjoyed the art style. I enjoyed the game. Uh, I played it a little bit afterwards, um, but I haven't really delved back into it um, since. I, I mean, it, it's it's definitely scratches an itch uh, as far as like a like an older kind of art style, graphic style for me. Uh, but I just haven't had it, honestly had an opportunity to to play it. Yeah, uh, what do you think about him releasing DLC for free for an indie game? Because I think no one would complain if he charged for it being an indie developer, right? No, I think it's completely surprising, especially um, after the conversation you and I were, were having a little bit earlier off offline, the fact that these developers are just excited about getting the game out the door. So uh, any type of DLC is just extra work on their end that honestly isn't required. It's more of a, a labor of love type thing. And, and if he has a fan base for this game, which obviously he does, uh, he's excited to try to maybe capitalize on that, uh, give them a little bit more than they anticipated and uh, future for, for stuff that might come out by him. Yeah, and it, it provides another marketing uh, push for him too, right? Where he can include sure. it in the original game and the game could probably sell again in a complete edition of some sort. So that's really dope. It would be cool to see when this DLC comes out, maybe he gets a limited run from limited run games for a physical version of the game. I might end up picking that up just to have because I love the game so much. That'd be really dope. Um, next up in an update that's uh, pretty important to me, but probably not to... I wouldn't even say this update in particular is important to me, but this game is very Jared centric and that's Marvel's Avengers talked about this game. It's not a perfect game by any means. Uh, swimming in sevens at the very best, but I absolutely adore it. We talked about obviously the Square Enix updates in terms of the war for Wakanda expansion that's coming later this year, Chris, which I'm excited about and I hope turns the game around in a real way. But we had an update this week. People have been wondering, you know, they announced Spider-Man as a PlayStation exclusive. When is that coming out? We don't really know. You know, Clint Barton just recently released. We don't have any idea what the new character is. And they officially confirmed that Spider-Man has been delayed beyond the start of the summer, um, which in my opinion is the right move. It's kind of a poor thing to focus on a character for one platform when you're having a hard enough time 
keeping a player base on any platform, right? The last thing you want to do is kind of uh, gift something to one third of the limited player base you already have. So I think it's a smart move for them because they still need to justify why players should be continue playing this game on any platform. And the moment you release an exclusive character like that, you're basically cutting off two thirds of your player base and saying, well, you're not the priority right now. And they're like, well, we haven't been the priority at all. So <laughs> what's the point, you know? Um, yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, I think that the biggest thing for them is that the biggest complaint from the fan base is, is great. You're giving us characters, but where's the end game? So if they, they need to get to the Wakanda DLC first before they can drip feed any more characters out because the Kate Bishop thing was great. Uh, and having the other characters being added in is fine but you have to have something to do with them afterwards. Uh, I saw people on Twitter just, they're like, hey, Kate's great, but I'm not going to 150 because there's no reason to do so. So you have to give yeah. people a reason to do so first. And then once you once you do that, bringing in Spider-Man's fantastic because it's like, well, now I've got two or three areas that I can go into. Uh, and now I can, you know, get the character to 150 and have rewards at the end that actually mean something. Well, and that's the reason why Spider-Man wasn't on the roadmap of those end game events were, right? Like the raid and the cloning lab and all that stuff because... That is what the game's missing is end game content and a reason to play the game daily. Frankly, like this is a game I absolutely adore when it originally released, I was playing it every day. Then it got to a point where I was playing it at least a couple of times a week. Now I hop in maybe once or twice a week just to check out what's going on with the store and stuff. But yeah, outside of my two main characters, that being cap and Hulk for me personally, I have no incentive to get any character to 150, even those characters I love, because like you said, there is no end game and focusing and prioritizing Spider-Man is kind of dumb when it's an exclusive character um at all and to your point they, they maybe shouldn't focus on characters period but they are in a weird place where they do need to provide new content but at the same time they need to add overall content to have players come back and play the game on top of the fact that they need to have the end game content it's just another pitfall of these games of service titles and yeah. the the good thing is we have a roadmap through 2021 which to be quite honest, when the year started, I didn't even know if we were going to get that because of how poorly the game launched. Um, so I'm glad uh, that that's happening. And there's going to be something we talk about a little bit later where this could have some more success in the future based on where it could end up. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Next up, uh, we have a Nakamura update. If you're wondering, what what does that mean? That's a, What's a Nakamura update? So Kumi Nakamura, if you don't remember, was the Ghostwire lead for Tango Gameworks who came out and showed off Ghostwire Tokyo and the internet and the gaming industry kind of fell in love with her at that point. She was very eccentric, very lovable. She had a passion for gaming. And then kind of after that update happened, she disappeared and people were wondering, did she leave Tango? What happened? Ended up turning out she got pregnant. She was having a kid, completely understandable. But then some more stuff recently came out where she's actually going to be opening up her new, uh, her own studio. She left Tango because of work stress. Uh, and she says with this new studio, she wants to hire quote, as many foreigners as she can because it's stimulating to learn about new cultures. And she said her other objective for the studio is to achieve full gender equality, which is awesome. Those are both great things to shoot for. You want to have a culturally dynamic studio. You definitely want to have gender equality. And she goes on in the story to talk about how when she was working at Capcom, there were days when she would see other developers eating under their desks and sleeping at their desks and just very bad work environment stuff that it's you know typical at this point, sadly, for the games industry. And you know it's all about creative control at the end of the day, I think, for these developers and for her. I think she saw the grind of the AAA industry and she kind of wants to have her own studio and see what she's doing. She's very eccentric. She's very much an oddball. I'm excited to see what she does. I hope she sticks in the horror genre, but I'm open to see whatever they make. Um, what, what do you think about this whole situation in terms of her getting to open her own studio? what she wants to do with the studio and um, you know, burnout in the AAA space. I think it was interesting because of the reception she got uh, from the presentation and how people were so excited about her and her energy. Uh, and then immediately like she was leaving the studio it was like, wait, what? It doesn't make a whole <laughs> yeah. lot of sense. Uh, but the fact that she's coming back and maybe the reason why she was leaving is just she, uh, to your point, she was just like, I don't like the way things are being done here and I want to change. And so the only way to make change is to be the change. And that's what she's doing. She's going to be going into a studio where she wants to achieve full gender equality. She wants to have uh, diversity amongst the staff. And she has a direction and, and kind of a, a maybe a genre that she really feels comfortable in. 
and that's where she's going to lead a team. And I don't doubt do it well, uh, considering the energy and the vibe that she got, at least for, that she gave off uh, in that presentation. She's a really good follow on Twitter, too. She's always talking about things she finds inspiring, entertainment she's watching. Like, she's just a very, like, open person, and the energy is kind of electric. And that's why she kind of got the following she did is because people really connected with her in that way. And, you know, over the last couple of weeks, we saw Jade Raymond open up studio. Now we have Akumi Nakamura. It's really dope to see these females lead these studios where that's not a normal thing in the industry yet. Uh, so it's really cool to see two new studios open up with female heads. And I hope to see more in the future. So good on that. Uh, next up, small little tidbit, Xbox Live is no longer Xbox Live. It's going to be called Xbox Network. And in addition to that, the more important news, in my opinion anyways, is that party chat and free-to-play games will not require Xbox Live Gold anymore. This is good. This was kind of an archaic thing that has stuck around with Xbox for some reason, despite how player-friendly they have been. Uh, you know, you shouldn't have to have Xbox Live Gold for free-to-play games, especially games as large as, you know, Apex Legends and Fortnite and all these titles, uh, where a lot of them are kid-based in terms of the players that are playing these games. And it's a smarter move to have them be free to play. And then party chat, you know, social services. Why should people have to pay to talk to their friends online, right? I think these are both good moves. Um, well needed. A little bit over, uh, a little bit late in terms of when they should happen. But at least they're happening anyways. Uh, what do you think about these considering you have kids yourself, Chris, in terms of paying for Xbox Gold? Sure, yeah. I, I think that this just kind of unionizes the entire Xbox uh, ecosystem, and it's the Xbox network now. There's no confusion between Live and Game Pass and this and that. I, I feel like everything eventually is just going to... I know they they like the term Game Pass, but I have a feeling everything's housed now under the game uh, the Xbox network. Eventually, it might just be called the Xbox network, and you won't even have to hear the name Game Pass any longer. It might switch over to that. I like the fact that... Uh, Free to play games are free, man. Like, I mean, that's the whole point of free to play games is why, <laughs> yeah. why should I be paying for a service when it's called free? Uh, so uh, Xbox is finally getting on board with something that, you know, I, I feel like they're, they're a little late to the game on this, but hey, better late than never. They took the criticism on the chin. People complained. They listened. Things changed. That's how things work. So I, I'm glad that it, they at least are moving in this direction. And it was even a sore subject on Xbox, I think, than PlayStation because... Xbox had most of their games coming to PC, right? So when you have people on Xbox playing with people on PC and the people on PC don't have to pay for the people on Xbox do, it makes it really weird as a weird, really weird dynamic. So it's good to see them clean that up. Like you said, uh, you know, better late than never. Uh, but, you know, it happens. So at least that, that went that way. Uh, the Xbox network thing is interesting. I, I, I'm with you. I wonder if it all consolidates eventually into one kind of banner, right? Um, sure. Who knows? Next up, Kojima Productions, the developers behind Death Stranding, obviously Kojima behind the Metal Gear franchise. The studio art director, Yoji Shikawa, when asked about the studio's second game in an interview, interestingly replied, I could, I could tell you probably that we can announce it quite soon in regards to Kojima Productions' second game. Obviously, they released Death Stranding, came out on PlayStation 4, and then it eventually made its way to PC. It's still unclear whether or not this is another partnership with Sony where it'll be a PS5 exclusive or if it's a multi-platform game, we don't know. I think a lot of times people get confused that Kojima Productions is a Sony first-party studio. It isn't, so we don't actually don't know where this game's landing. Um, that being the case, my money personally, Chris, would be on it being another PlayStation exclusive because of Kojima's partnership with Sony and that relationship he's built over the years. Let's say it is that. Let's say... It is a Sony game. It's going to be an exclusive or at least a timed exclusive until it comes to PC. Do you think them saying we can probably see it quite soon is them hinting at the June slash summer Sony event, right? The state of play where we get their slate of upcoming games. Because when you look at the roadmap for Sony, a lot of their games are already well-known quantities. We're just waiting for dates, right? And a little bit more information on these titles. And something from Kojima Productions could be that pop that their show could miss, right? Otherwise, yeah, I mean, it fits into the time frame. Uh, Death Stranding came out in November of 2019, so that makes sense. About two, uh, you know, closing in on two years later, they're going to have some version of an announcement of a new game that's going to be coming. Doesn't mean it's going to come out this year or even next year. Just it's typical Kojima fashion. We need to have a build up, and we need to be able to anticipate lots and lots of trailers. They use the Decima engine from Gorilla, so I'm assuming that they're super familiar with the PS and they're going to just continue to do that or maybe do an upgrade version of that, you know, moving into the PS5. But it does make sense to have it a partnership with uh, PlayStation, especially since 
the game is moving to PC anyway. So, I mean, he's double dipping regardless. Although I, I would think soon that it would make the most sense if he wants his uh, games to be to a larger audience to eventually, you know, break away from that. But he may be contractually obligated for at least two games under under Sony before that happens. So I, I think that it's exciting news. Anytime Kojima does something, it becomes news. So um, I'm just anticipating not knowing what the hell it is for the full two <laughs> years that we have to hear about it up until the game release. Yeah, and I wonder if it's going to be in a strand game genre or if it's going to be something entirely different. Um, Death Stranding never really interested me from the jump. Uh, I like how weird it is and how creator-driven and distinct the visuals are, but the gameplay of like delivering packages and stuff never really just was my vibe. I never felt interested in ever trying it. So I'd be open to see what their studio has next. Um, it would be wild, Chris, if... We're all wrong, and the moment Death Stranding released, it was a one-game contract, and Phil Spencer jotted over to you know Kojima Production was like, "Here's a blank check. Your next game, we want it on Xbox, full creative control." It'd be wild, right? I don't think it's that would ever happen, honestly, uh, and I don't think this game would. Uh, but that would be a, such a crazy reveal this summer is if the next Kojima Productions game is an Xbox exclusive. God, the internet would lose their minds. Uh, that'd be oh. wild. Yeah, I mean, I Xbox right now is just it, it, anything is possible. Like it's so yeah. scary. Like we were, I, I was talking about it in our in our chat like earlier this week with the the Ubisoft the Ubisoft Plus. It's like Jesus, if they take Ubisoft too, like that's I mean that's everything. Like what like where else are you gonna play your games at? So it's just just crazy. Like and that it would it literally it would blow me away, but it wouldn't shock me if that's if they'll just open up a checkbook and did that. Yeah, it'd be that moment. It'd be that momentary what, and then you'd be like. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's one of those. Uh, yep. Phil Spencer, man. And he's been doing a lot of work over in Japan, as we'll get to with this next story. In terms of meeting with devs, he got the Yakuza series come over to Xbox, Kingdom Hearts. Uh, just working with all these teams. I, I mean, now they have Tango Gameworks with the acquisition of Bethesda. He's been putting in the legwork for Japanese developers, and it wouldn't be quite surprising. Maybe years ago, when Xbox was not even thinking of touching Japan, with Phil being over there all the time, I wouldn't be surprised, but we'll see. Next up, talking about that Japanese connection with Phil Spencer, Square Enix and Game Pass. So recently, Octopath Traveler was announced to be coming to Xbox Game Pass, and it launched on, on the service, uh, which is quite surprising. We never really see these JRPGs come from a Nintendo platform to Xbox, right? It's usually, if it launches on PlayStation, then it goes to Nintendo, and then maybe way, way later it comes to Xbox. Or the opposite of that, where launches on Nintendo, then comes to PlayStation, and then way, way later comes to Xbox. This is one of the first cases where this thing launched on Nintendo, and it's coming to Xbox before it lands on PlayStation, which is quite surprising. Um, but the news here is that six or more Square Enix games will be coming to Xbox Game Pass. Reportedly, this is already confirmed between Microsoft and Square Enix, so reportedly there's already the deal closed. And an official announcement is only a matter of time. This totally seems like a E3 summertime announcement during their big presentation. And honestly, uh, earlier we were talking about Marvel's Avengers. Chris, I would not be surprised if Marvel's Avengers ends up in Game Pass, um, especially because it has such a dwindling player base. I know people say like, well, how are they going to make money if they don't charge on DLC? And I think at this point, they're, we've seen people make money in Game Pass regardless where it's the word of mouth where their friends don't have Game Pass, but they want to buy the game to play with them. and. Honestly, it might be at a point with Marvel's Avengers where the player base is so low that this is like the one out they have to try to get players back into the game to some extent. We already know Outriders is launching day and date on April 1st into the service, which is awesome. But that leaves five more games, and that leaves me questioning, like, what could they be? Are they new titles we don't know about? My, you want to know a big one for me that would be announced this summer, Chris? Imagine if... When they finally announced that Final Fantasy VII Remake is coming to Xbox, it's launching into Xbox Game Pass. Yeah, that was my first thought. My first thought was Final Fantasy because that's a big get. That's like, hey, that's an like you associate that just the same way you associate Kingdom Hearts with with PlayStation. But if Xbox is able to pull it over and they already have Game Pass, it's just like it's free. So I guess you know <laughs> yeah. I, that's that. I, I might I might not have been playing it before, but I guess I am now. It's, I feel like that's the way with the Game Pass is right now. Like if you look at our Twitter timeline, people are just like, "I got nothing to play," but then they open up their Xbox Game Pass and they have forty games in their backlog. It's like it, I didn't have to pay for it, so if I don't like it, I don't have to play for it. You know, play it very long. Xbox is just 
banging after one after another after another like every time i see the ne- like the new week where they show what the dropped releases are it's like eight more games and you're like oh my god they got that too so it's just insane yeah and the the cool thing with that in terms of their not being an entry fee for these games outside of paying for the service obviously is not only from a player's perspective do you not have to worry about having to like the game because you spent money on it but from the developer's perspective i think they have a better chance of keeping those players interested in the game because there isn't that pressure to look for reasons to like the game people can go in carefree try the game out and i think they're less critical that way to try out new things and be okay with maybe some bruises or bumps with indie titles whereas if you buy a game and you spend money on it you're going to be way more critical on it right because you spent your hard-earned money on it so i do think it helps developers in that way too and we've seen the revenue streams like they've reported multiple times that developers are making money from game pass um so I'm really interested to see what these six titles are. Uh, once again, Phil Spencer putting in that legwork for Japan, um, having Square Enix titles come to the the platform. We didn't even mention Dragon Quest, which is huge. Coming uh, Dragon Quest eleven was it nine or eleven? I always forget what the Roman numerals were for that game. If it was I X or X I, but that came to the service late last year. So um, a lot of awesome stuff there, and I'm intrigued to see what else is coming from Square Enix. Next up, game adaptations. This isn't really news. I thought this was, I mean, there is news here. They announced that a Ghost of Tsushima movie is in development, but there was a really cool thread that popped up over on Reset Era, Chris, where somebody was just like, hey, this is another game adaptation. Let me list everything that's in development because sometimes we can lose track, right? So I wanted to go through and list all of the video game adaptations that are currently in development or set to release soon because uh, it's way more than I remembered, Chris. So you ready for this list? (laughs) Go ahead. So first up, we got the Mortal Kombat movie, which is coming out soon. Already got a trailer. I'm really excited for that. Uh, looks cool. We got the Uncharted movie, uh, which wrapped filming with Tom Holland. We got the Halo TV series, which is now launching in Paramount+. Plus. We got Tomb Raider 2, starring Alicia Vikander, the sequel to the movie that came out a couple years ago. Uh, we got Borderlands, the movie. That's featuring uh, Kevin Hart and Kate Blanchett, I believe. We got a Brothers in Arms TV series, which to me totally feels like a HBO miniseries of like six to eight episodes, which might be interesting. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Call of Duty movie that's been in development forever. Uh, I don't know if you remember this one, Chris. There's that Division movie starring Jake Gyllenhaal that's still in I, development. That's, oh, wow. That was like two or three years ago when they brought that up, yeah. right? When Division 2 came out, yeah. I, I didn't know about this one. And good Lord, I don't think this movie will ever see the light of day. Uh, there's a Duke Nukem movie in development. Which oh, I don't I know not. if that would, yeah oh god uh, maybe during the Trump administration I don't think it'll work fly <laughs> anymore uh, one of the ones I'm excited for the Fallout TV series uh, sure. my hope for this is that it's an anthology where each episode is a different vault I think that'd be really dope uh, Gears and War movie which has kind of been in development hell I still want Dave Bautista to star as Marcus Phoenix who knows if that movie will ever happen in reality uh, we got the Last of Us TV series which is starring Lady Mormont and uh, Pet, uh, Pedro Pascal. Uh, really excited for that. We got the announcement today of the Ghost of Tsushima movie. Uh, there's the Minecraft movie. I don't know if you remember. This was in development. Originally being directed by the actor from Always Sunny. I forget his name. Uh, Mekel uh, He stars in that game development show on Apple+. Plus. Uh, yeah. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. But he ended up leaving the project, so I don't even know who's directing it anymore. Uh, we got the Metal Gear Solid movie, which is in development by... Jordan uh, Vote Roberts, who did Kong Skull Island, underrated uh, kaiju movie. If you haven't checked it out, check it out. Uh, Pokemon Detective Pikachu 2. I thought the first one was good. It wasn't a great movie, but it was good. Live action Pokemon, really cool to see on the on the screen. Uh, we got an Assassin's Creed TV series, which I completely forgot about following the uh, the movie that was um, something. Uh, yeah. We got Sonic 2, which the first one was a surprising hit. I haven't seen it yet, but I, I heard families really enjoyed it, and it was a lot better than people anticipated, given the weird uh, model that Sonic originally had and they changed it. Uh, Sleeping Dogs movie. Um, obviously, it's a dead franchise now, but at least I can see some life with the movie. Uh, Disco Elysium TV series, which I completely forgot about. Obviously, this is the... Was it 2019 or 2020? The the Game Award darling uh, computer RPG that people found. 2019. Up with. Yeah, the dystopian uh, like yep. Russian RPG, I think. Yeah, I started uh, that. I played it for about three or four hours. Did you like it? Uh, it was, it's just really dialogue out. heavy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like you literally have to be in the mode to read a book. 
Yeah. Uh, and then the Twisted Metal TV series, which I think is being developed by the Deadpool writers. A lot of stuff there. Uh, who knows if uh, any of these things are going to be good. Uh, I'm excited for Mortal Kombat because it looks like it's people that care about Mortal Kombat making the movie. I don't think it'll be a necessarily a, like a critical darling, but I think it will be true to Mortal Kombat, uh, which is cool. In terms of everything else on this list, uh, I would say I'm most excited for Pokemon Detective Pikachu 2 because I'm a huge Pokemon fan. And uh, Last of Us, obviously. And then the Fallout TV series. Like Those three are probably the ones that I'm most excited for. A lot of these other ones are either in development hell or just a franchise I don't exactly care about. Um, you know, the division with Jake Gyllenhaal, Chris, I think sounds cool. I like him as an actor and I love the world of division, but we're at a point now is like, is that movie ever going to even be made? <laughs> you know? Sure, uh, sure. So who knows? Uh, if you can remember anything I talked about on this, because it's a quite lengthy list. What has you the most excited? Uh, the last of us is probably the biggest one. Um, and I was listening to another podcast where they mentioned, uh, Sony potentially bringing out horizon zero dawn. And I was like, Oh yeah, that would definitely be a, an amazing series. Like it's, it's hard because everybody who has an idea or has a game thinks it can be a movie. And I think that the, the drawing power for most of these is a, a good story, which the last of us has. And to a point horizon zero dawn has, and there's a lot that can be drawn from that. And then, you know, what is the appeal to gamers and how much has it sold? So you have to take that into account too, because your core audience is going to be mostly that. And then people who find out that it's a great movie on top of that. So, um, and then you have to pick where you're going to see it at. I mean, are we going Netflix? Are we going to do a, a straight to video from home? Or are we going to ask people to come to the theater? Because the likelihood of it being more successful is in the vein of The Witcher rather than if The Witcher was at the movie theater. So I think you, you have to kind of pick pick your avenue. And then on top of that, your audience, you know what I mean? And where that goes. So we'll see. A lot of these sound like they're just going to be in development hell. My brother works in, in, uh, in LA and, and works for a major studio. And a lot of these just like they're, they sound great across paper. And then as soon as somebody has to put in money or there has to be put into development, they just don't see the light of day. Yeah. Which is strange too, because as we know with Hollywood, they'll always rather go with the known franchise as opposed to something new. So I think that's why we are seeing this trend of video game adaptations because it's like, oh, it's a known quantity, right? Uh, sure. One one that wasn't listed here is a Demon Souls film is in the in the works too. That one's weird to me. So as much as I love the From Software games, I think at best those would work well in an animated form because the narrative of those games have nothing to really do with the main character in terms of them having a personality, right? Uh, you kind of live vicariously through the side characters you interact with. So... Say like a Demon Souls movie comes out and they cast like I don't know who's the A list action guy right now. Uh, uh, the Rock. Maybe I, I was thinking maybe somebody of a slider build. Uh, oh, okay. Like uh, Joel Kinnaman, say right for instance. Sure, sure. Uh, Joel Kinnaman gets cast. Like, no matter who you put in that role, I think it's going to be awkward because those games aren't built on the lead character, the knight or the warrior being the personality. So I think it's going to come across as hokey and weird. Um, and I think maybe in an animated series, you can lean more on the grotesque bosses and all that stuff and make it more like a Castlevania or the recently released Dota animated series. Uh, because when you go live action, I think so much hinges, especially on a film of that main character being likable, right? And being relatable. Sure. And you don't really get that in the From games. Um, though maybe like a Bloodborne horror film could, could work in, in a weird way. But who knows? We'll see what happens. There are a lot of adaptations. Who knows if they ever see uh, the light of day. Let's get into this ID at Xbox showcase. In partnership with Twitch Gaming, Xbox held an ID at Xbox showcase, which revealed new indie games, provided updates, and included developer interviews. Uh, we're going to go through some of the games that caught our eye, Chris. But first, I wanted to give some quick notes from the showcase. First off, it was announced that developers have earned well over $2 billion. Yes, that's with a B billion dollars via the ID at Xbox program over its history, which I believe started in 2013. That's a lot of money. Um, good for them. Get your money, indie developers. And secondly, 12 minutes is in the quote, final stages, unquote, of development confirmed to release in 2021. Uh, the developer kind of doubled down on that. He said it's definitely coming out this year. He just doesn't know when exactly. We talked about before the show, Chris, I think they probably have a good idea of where it's releasing, but that's going to be a summer announcement to pop on the state, you know, whatever presentation or live direct video Xbox has. So no surprise there. Let's get to these games though. So I came with five. Chris came with his own selection 
And I think it'd be best if we go back and forth in terms of the games that caught our eye, Chris, and uh, yeah. kind of give our best our best example of explaining these games to the audience. So I'm going to start with probably what's one of the more notable headline games of this entire presentation, which was Drinkbox Studios' new game. Uh, you should know them from Guacamelee 1 and 2 or Severed, which are all incredible games. Um, just a really underrated studio. One of my favorite indie developers across the board. They announced Nobody Saves the World. So this is a really cool roguelike RPG style game where uh, maybe roguelike's the wrong word, but you, the core of this game is you're working through these dungeons, getting gear, defeating enemies. Uh, but the the drawback here is you can't use an overpowered character or a setup over and over again and just run through this game. It forces you to switch through characters and makes you adapt on the fly, which I think is pretty neat. It's kind of shape shifts your character on the go, and it's a mix mash of a bunch of different type of characters. There's like this muscular like bodybuilder dude with like a fish head. There's like a tiny little possessed girl doll thing. It looks really cool. There's like a horse. Like it just looks like a horse that you have to control. Uh looks really funny. Has their typical brand of humor in it. Uh has their color palette that you should know from Guacamelee and Severed. I'm excited for it. I think like I said, they're an underrated developer. Not enough people play Guacamelee one or two. Not enough people play Severed. All incredible games. I can't wait for this to come out. It's launching late summer 2021. And uh, what's going to probably be the theme of this entire segment, Chris, it's launching an Xbox Game Pass day one. So there you go. can't get much better than that. Uh, uh, the, I was going to say, the game, I, the game I... I uh, it was the first game they showed was the Exomeca, and that's that, that free first-person place, uh, first person, uh, multi, multiplayer game that they showed. Um, it's done by Twisted Red, and uh, it's coming out in, in, in Q4, t- Q3, Q4. I would guess it's going to fall out later uh, just because they're probably going to run uh, some version of a beta on this because uh, it being an online multiplayer game, they're going to want to make sure that it, it fits uh, and everything is, is running on all cylinders. But um, it had, like, a, a Pacific Rim-type vibe. I mean, I people were sh- were stating, like, Titanfall. To me, it felt like a poor man's Titanfall, maybe. I mean, I think maybe the Titanfall thing had to do with the grappling hook um, and the jumping, but you hop into mechs. Um, there's going to be, you know, obviously different types of guns, different types of rewards. Uh, there's off diff- different vehicles. We saw some underwater play, which I thought was super interesting. I thought that was actually more interesting than most of the other stuff. Um, seeing a character, like, literally jump out of a plane and, like, uh, zip over to uh, a helicopter and shoot it, I thought was kind of cool. It just looked really interesting it to the point where like there were some mechanics that looked a little different, the underwater stuff specifically for me. Uh, other than that, it kind of has a standard, you know, the basic first person shooter type stuff. Like um, yeah. you and I were discussing that uh, maybe the graphics, at least in the, the visuals that we saw, weren't kind of like a list. But then again, you know, that could be all worked out by Q4 and it could be just, you know, tinking you know tinkering here and tinkering there and, and and fixing it but it looked cool cool enough that i would be interested in at least giving it a shot and playing do we know if that's launching an xbox game pass at all uh we do because it's 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 first on xbox um and according to the xbox wire it is um and it should be they said it should be coming out in tail into q3 early part of q4 because i think this is a game that will live or die based on how it feels like people downloading the game mm-hmm. and seeing how it actually feels because there's so many first person shooter games out there and uh, a lot of those uh, live or die by if they just feel good to play. And if this game comes out, like you said, and it polishes itself up and it is kinetically fun to play and it feels good in terms of a first person shooter, it could definitely get its own audience. And it looks interesting enough. And like you said, not really Titanfall. There's a lot more chrome and silver <laughs> than maybe a Titanfall. Uh, it reminds me yeah. of, you know, any classic Gundam or Mecha anime or show you've seen just a lot of metal uh in your face which looks really cool um next up i would like to refer to this game as jared bait so we got an isometric uh souls like game uh so it's called death store it's from acid nerve who are the developers of titan souls which is a really popular pc game that came out a couple years ago uh really fun mechanic where you can only attack once with your character and it was like a boss rush style game this seems to be their coming out party where they learn the lessons from that game has a lot of the core mechanics of titan souls but fleshed out they went from a more 2d aesthetic to 3d uh, it's coming out summer 2021 uh, i would describe it as a zelda like adventure game uh, it has an anthropomorphic raven as the main character uh, like i said isometric with a focus on scale for boss fights uh, one of the really cool things is the hub world for this game 
is a black and white noir um, art style. And then once you get into the actual world, it's a really colorful pop, feels fantasy, feels Zelda-like. I cannot wait for this game. Seems like it's pretty skill-based in terms of the boss fights you having to dodge and attack. And like I said, the scale, a lot of these bosses, kind of, they play with the perspective of it being isometric. So when some of these bosses come on screen, you get to really see the size difference between your little warrior and the bosses. Uh, one thing to note here, I think a lot of people got a misconception that this is a roguelike. It isn't. The developers told uh, the interviewer on the showcase that it's a linear, narrative-based, single-player game. There's going to be exploration and mysteries to find and all that stuff, RPG elements, but it's not a roguelike. It's a single, start-to-finish, single-player experience. So that's really cool. I'm excited for this game a whole lot. Like I said, Jared Bait through and through, they got me on this one. <laughs> Uh, the game that I, I saw that I liked, was like something that showed for like, I don't know, what did I say? Like 30 seconds, maybe it was so fast. It was called Meat Streets. Um, and it's a, a physics based, uh, multiplayer game that is a beat em up brawler. Like it was just like really cool. It reminded me like sort of, of like a uh, streets of rage or like double dragon, but like in, you know, 2021 and you can like fight each other with actual like the physics movements of it i think it is its biggest uh advantage and that, uh, that's why they kind of harp on that is the fact that like when you move things it like moves like a, as if the body movement was going so like if you overshoot on a punch like you're you're to complete follow through so the other person can come in and take an uppercut and you're also able to use all kinds of items throughout the uh the game so like there was one with the toilet paper there's one where somebody was throwing a soccer ball a trash can like it's just uh it, there was a dodgeball game at one point i saw like it so it looks like it's it's interesting i know it's a, a multiplayer fighter game it again those are like games that have replay value if you have other people playing with you so i'm hoping that it has a little bit more than just a couch co-op where you can play online and and that's the, the basis of it I know it's coming to Steam as well, so I wonder if there's going to be any version of crossplay at all if Xbox can get it for the PC. So I'm hopeful for that as well. Man, it would be dope if uh, these small games like this, where it's like brawlers or beat 'em ups, I love when they partner with, like, say, the platform they come out on, so Xbox. And it'd be cool if there was unlockable characters like Master Chief or Marcus Phoenix or even other things like maybe like Banjo and Kazooie. In addition to maybe other characters from other fighting games, if they work out a partnership like that, I think that's really cool because it builds into the interest of the game. Because like you said, this genre is typically the games are rather short and it's all about replaying them over and over again. And they're also about playing with people, right? Like the single player experience is not as good as playing with people. So like having a strong net code and having some fun characters to play with uh, in terms of a roster is important. So uh, not for me, but I do think that like, like you, it caught the eye of people who love those old school Streets of Rage style beat em ups. And this plus the, you know, this wasn't an ID at Xbox Showcase, but the new Ninja Turtles game. Like, it's cool to see a kind of a, a mini resurgence of the style of beat em ups. So that's cool. Uh, my next one. So, some of my favorite games, Chris, are Limbo, Inside, Ori and the Will of the Wisps, Ori and the Blind Forest. These 2D games that have a gorgeous art style, parallaxing backgrounds. So, my. The level of quality I look for in these style of games is kind of high. I'm kind of a snob when it comes to these style of games. One that caught my eye in this presentation was Song of Iron, which shockingly I found out was developed by a single person. His name's John. Couldn't find his last name, so shout out to John of Song of Iron. I uh, couldn't find uh, out what his full name was. But this game's coming out in 2021. It's essentially a 3D side-scrolling Viking epic. The lighting in this trailer looked fantastic. There's parts where you're stealthing behind goblins and orcs. There's parts where you're wielding a fiery flaming axe going straight into battle with your shield. It looks really cool. I love that Vikings are in vogue right now. We're seeing Vikings everywhere right between Valheim and Valhalla and all of these titles. It just seems like the the uh, the the character of the moment. You know, we kind of go back and forth between pirates and ninjas and Vikings and cowboys kind of in this weird uh, ever rotating wheel. And yeah, it looks really cool. The art style is amazing. Like I said, the parallaxing backgrounds, beautiful. Slated for 2021. Uh, the thing I appreciate is I was looking through his Twitter, Chris, and in his reply, somebody had asked like, hey, we didn't get a concrete release date. Like, when do you expect it? And he said, I'm hoping to get this out in 2021. But if I'm being honest, I'm not going to announce the date until I actually know it's going to release on that date, which we can all appreciate. I think the last yeah, thing he wants move. to do is announce a really state and then delay it over and over again, right? So you got to love the honesty there. Uh, 
one of the games that I really liked and enjoyed the art style of was Art of Rally. Um, and I didn't really realize that it was a game on Steam that had been out since uh, since September of like last year. But uh, it's got rave reviews. It has of that like indie racing scene, that city street uh, type vibe where you're you're drifting from corner to corner. But what they are kind of pushing is more realistic, real world scenarios, real world, you know, cities, towns, that sort of thing. And some of the cool stuff is, is they even have a, a night scenario where you have like your headlights on and you can do the drifting at night or you can do it drifting in the snow and there's crowds. It's real pixelated. It has, it has like a, like an N64 type vibe to me, like that kind of style or artistic style. And it just seems real relaxing. It's like, just like this game that you can put on and put a podcast on and kind of go to town for a while and just kind of zone out. And I really appreciated just how simplistic it was. The only thing that kind of bummed me out is like watching the trailers on the ID at Xbox. They didn't really tell you a whole lot about the game. I had to do a lot more digging and, and kind of watch videos off of Steam to get a little more information on what it was. Yeah. Uh, as somebody, well, we talked about this before the show. We're both not super like car racing guys. It kind of caught my eye too. Uh, it helps that it's launching in a Game Pass. I do like the art style. It seems like it might end up being one of the more welcoming racing games because that genre can be so focused on the hardcore audience. Even like Forza Horizon, which is more uh, arcadey than the simulation motorsport games, uh, it still is a little bit more for the car enthusiast than your your typical layman. Uh, but this looks like a cool entry level. Like we said, Game Pass gives you the opportunity to check it out risk free, and I'll definitely be downloading this when it comes out. I may not hook me. But it'll get some hours out of me at the very least because the art style is so cool. If they can nail the music in that game, Chris, ooh, when you're driving, yeah, it's going to be yeah. great. Next yeah, that up. That would be pretty, pretty cool. Next up, The Wild at Heart. So this is for Moonlight Kids. This is our first game. Uh, it has a, a very uh, don't starve costume quest art style. If you're familiar with that, like storybook. Um, it looks really interesting. It's, I would say the gameplay is relatively similar to costume quest or pikmin so you have these kids out on an adventure trying to explore the world and figure out things for themselves the main character is this you know it looks like a you know 10 to 13 year old boy with a hoodie and a and a jean jacket and he's accompanied by this little girl who has a helmet with goggles on totally reminds me of uh luis from bob's burgers if you're familiar with that cartoon mm -hmm. but the gameplay looked like they were fighting off these creatures with these pikmin like characters they gather around the world uh, there's some like light horror elements to it. Uh, seems like environments change. Um, but the crux of the game seems to be lighthearted and adventurous with these two little kids trying to explore the world around him. Um, I'm really interested to see where this game lands in terms of, in terms of it's like gameplay loop. Cause that's something that wasn't super clear. Like they showed you adventuring and fighting, but I don't know what the purpose of that is. Like, are you trying to discover something in particular are you looking for maybe a lost friend that like the, the crux of the narrative of the game is what will determine if I'm hooked to this or not. Um, but it looks really cool. Like I said, love the art style. Don't starve is a survival game. So I couldn't really get into that, but I really enjoyed the art style of don't starve. So having a game similar to that. And as I've mentioned on the, on the podcast before, I love the costume quest games. So anything similar to that, I'm, I'm down for, um, wild at heart come in May 20th. So re relatively soon. Launching an Xbox Game Pass. Can't wait. They showed the AI uh, self-learning from Hello Neighbor 2. And I like, I, that's when I perked up. I was like, ooh, this is interesting. <laughs> like, not just, because uh, I, like, I wasn't a big fan of, of Hello Neighbor. Like, I, I, I appreciate the game and I, I get the concept of it. Um, the story is kind of secondary, which again, in this one, it, it seems like they're trying to beef that up a little bit more. Being a journalist going and, you know, trying to figure out what happened to the same neighbor <laughs> uh with people missing but the fact that the ai not only learns from you but it learns from other players and as you're playing the game it gets smarter so places that you could hide in the first run aren't the same place you can hide in the second run because the ai will catch it is more interesting and they showed like on the video where you're making a beeline on the left and typically they would make a beeline on the left or on the right. And then they start throwing objects to block the path so that you can't get over there or they start catching on to places that you've hidden. And I thought that that was just rad. Like, I'm like, this is very, very cool. 
if this concept uh, in AI, because the biggest complaint of most people is AI are stupid. Like, this is dumb. Like, there, there's no way that I'm going to be crouching in Valhalla and this guy behind me is not going to see me. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, like, for this, I just thought it was a lot more interesting. And they pulled it back so that you could see it from a top-down view. Obviously, it's a first person, but when you see it from a top-down view and you can see how the characters move, I thought that was interesting as well. And then I thought to myself, man, this game would be awesome if you could play it in that top-down view. Like, this would be a lot more interesting if you could do it in, you know, in a way that you could play the game in both versions. Well, but, uh, go ahead. I was going to say the wild thing is, uh, you know, it's not just that he knows you go one direction, so he goes that direction to cut you off. There's a moment where they showed when you were running towards a door, instead of him running to try and cut you off, he knows he can't make it in time. So he would pick up this item and throw it at this button that would close a door in front of you. It's like pretty wild stuff. Um, and to your point with AI, I think we're getting to a point with consoles where visual fidelity is not getting super impressive anymore. Like obviously the load times and stuff on the back end is cool, but going from, you know, 1440 to, to, you know, 4k and then to 8k, like that stuff's going to have diminishing returns. I think AI is where video games can see a huge leap moving forward. And this gets me excited because if this indie studio is working on the AI for their games and making it adapt to what you're doing, I hope this kind of connects to every other AAA developer and indie out there where, yeah, you can focus on the AI and people will be sold on your game because it's something that drives the overall gameplay. Really cool. Sure. And the other thing that they changed up in this game too is uh, Ravenbrook's used to be just like the one neighbor's house and that was it. But now it's open world and you can go into other people's houses. Now he'll still chase you and, and whatnot, but you can, the, the gameplay is emergent, which is, is even more interesting because before it was just like, okay, you keep doing the same sandbox and you just keep kind of doing the same thing. AI is not that intelligent. You hide from him and you move on. Now, not only is AI intelligent, but it's open world and you can go in, in different, have different stories being told at different times, depending on whose house you're entering. So I think that's, that's awesome as well. Yeah, they just added a bunch of weirdos on the map, which is a lot more right. than the, your neighbor across the street. It looks really cool. Um, and this is one of those games that people may not talk about all the time, but it's, look it up. It's a lot more successful and popular than you might think it is. Hello Neighbor was huge, huge. I was part of that Five Nights at Freddy's wave on YouTube of kids just being super interested in that game, and it blew up. Uh, my next one is Moon Glow Bay. This is from Bunny Hug Games. This is their first game. It's going to be launching 2021 into Xbox Game Pass. And the way I describe it is it's a relaxing fishing game with a Minecraft-like skin and a don't nod bug snacks narrative. And what I mean by that is, obviously, it's like block pixel based in terms of the art style. And it's all about you going out and fishing and relaxing in this little beach town and kind of just living your life. Where the don't nod bug snacks narrative uh, description comes in is that there's some like darker things under the water pun intended, uh, that kind of reveal themselves as time goes on, where you hear these stories about these legendary and weird fish that are in the ocean and stuff going on in the town. It doesn't really make sense because, you know, no one, you know, everyone's scared of fishing for some reason. And you slowly uncover why that is a neat little hint that the developers gave in their interview is that there's these stories of the souls of dead people or those who die in the water kind of manifesting under the water into creatures so that's kind of where the legend starts these weird beasts that live uh, just below the surface looks really cool it seems really sweet and kind and nice and a relaxing romp through this little town and i'm guaranteeing that by the end of it you're going to probably be dropping your jaw what the hell's going on um but overall looks really cool a uh, really unique perspective and once again i think this is developed by two people uh, I'll always be impressed by small teams cranking out these incredible games. Um, love the art style too. Like I said, Minecraft esque. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it for that one. I was on a conference call and had to hop back over to watch this ID to Xbox. And when I hopped in, I was like, wow, this game looks rad. And I didn't even know what it was. And then I found out it was last stop and was done by variable uh, state that, that did Virginia. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm already in. Cause like, I loved Virginia. <laughs> I thought it was amazing. Um, and so when I was watching it, I'm like, when I watched the trailer, I didn't really know a whole lot. Like, you, I mean, you see different characters and then you see the sci-fi stuff, but you don't get what's going on, which is kind of like Virginia. Uh, but this is a little bit different different because this is done in third person uh, versus the first person of Virginia and you play as three different characters not just one character so that's interesting where the characters come the this whatever this sci-fi event happens to be brings these characters together 
Um, I saw that there was like a body swapping thing that was kind of cool, like in the, with the father and the son, and they didn't know why they had changed bodies. But I, honestly, it doesn't matter. Anything Annapurna touches is like gold, and the fact that Variable State is doing this again is fantastic because the story in Virginia was A plus tier for me. So I'm I'm really excited about this game. Man, Virginia is actually one of the only games I've reviewed for Controlled Interest, and I absolutely loved it. It's really good. Uh, totally underrated. I think a lot of people missed out on it, unfortunately, which happens with indie games. But this was something I missed. Like, we talked about it for the show, and I'm like, wait, the people who made Virginia are making this game? And I had it on my list of games that I was interested in, but that didn't even click. And the moment you said that, I'm like, oh, so this is a must-play for me then. All right, got it. Uh, and once again, is that launching into Game Pass? Uh, it is launching into Game Pass, and it's also launching on Steam, too. So, I mean, a lot of these games that we see are doing that Game Pass slash Steam release, which is why they don't do, like, the Xbox ex- Well, I, I guess they could do the console exclusive thing, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, awesome. So many of these dope games launching into Game Pass. Can't complain. Uh, my last one I have is Alchemic Cutie, uh, which is a really funny name. Uh, so it's by Viridian Software. I'm unfamiliar if they've done other stuff. A quick Google search. I couldn't really find much. I think this might be their first game. Uh, it seems like they're a type of studio that maybe helped with other games as a support studio. This seems like their first outing. Uh, so it's coming out in 2021. It's self-described by them as a relaxing adventure RPG. I would describe the art style as Stardew Valley. So if you think of Stardew Valley, but instead of it being a like farming simulator style game, this is seems to be a Zelda-like RPG. Uh, very cute, adorable characters, a uh, lot of animals involved. Um, it looks like a really cool time. It reminds me a lot of, dang it, I'm trying to think of the name of, there's a game that came out last year, I think, where you're this miner, uh, M-I-N-E-R, not M-I-N-O-R, and it's a roguelike, and mm-hmm. you have like a little village, and you can go down, you gather stuff, and you come back up. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. But it has a similar art style to that. Um, but really interested in this. Uh, I have a slight interest in these like cutesy style games, but it's pretty much the gameplay that gets me hooked. Uh, so the aesthetic like draws me in, but if it doesn't have, you know, if it's just kind of simplistic, I'm not really into it for the long haul. Uh, unclear if this is coming to Game Pass. Didn't really mention that, but I'm wondering how deep this RPG is. If you like gain gear or if it's simply, you know, gathering materials. Um, it's they haven't fully described how much like Stardew Valley this is or how much like an actual RPG this is, right? Because describing your game as an RPG in 2021, it's like almost every game has RPG elements to some extent. Um, 100%. Yeah. I'm just, the pace too, is I'm calling it a relaxing adventure. This is probably a very slow paced game, which I'm totally down for. I'm just curious as to how much of this is, uh, you know, tending to a farm and gathering materials and how much is it like actually adventuring and killing monsters and upgrading your gear and stuff. Interested to see. Sure. That's pretty much it for me in terms of the games. I have a list of honorable mentions, which I'll get to uh, after you're done, Chris. Do you have anything else you wanted to talk about? No, that was about it. Yeah, I mean, it was it was pretty spaced out. Um, on a side note, I just, like, I enjoyed the games. Uh, just the presentation was just really kind of kind of long and, and drawn out, and I, 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 I wish for for the next event that they do with these id that they come heavy with like you know just show me show me the trailers and then we can talk about the the stuff afterwards i appreciate the dev that i was after but initially like it's so separated out that i had a hard time i had to like re-go back through and try to re-remember some of these games even even though i had written them down because they were so spaced out over three and a half hours and i think it's a byproduct of them partnering with twitch gaming because it seems like this was all produced by twitch gaming xbox kind of just like handed in the reins right Gave him the information, hooked him up with the developers, all that stuff. I hope the next one isn't even a partnership with Twitch Gaming. I hope it's just Xbox doing it because I think then it has a better chance of being the the more well-paced show we want it to be. Um, but I will give a shout out to, I like the dev interviews, which are really cool. A lot of really cool games. To your point, very drawn out, a lot of unnecessary empty space. Why are they taking three minute breaks? Like in the world of 2021, either pre-tape it or learn how to do a live show. No one's sitting at a live show to take a three minute break this isn't a, a a lord of the rings extended cut in theaters where you need to have a break in between to use the restroom and get popcorn you know what i mean um, yeah i mean something similar to the nindies is like you know what i mean like because that kind of stuff is i mean you still get some information and they they do some play gameplay of it but it's kind of quick it's like bang bang here comes well, another you one know the worst especially part? with 100 games 
You want to know the worst part? ID at Xbox has uploaded their own like announcement videos that are like five to eight minutes and have the indie titles, and they've done it before. Okay. So I wonder if this was just a money thing where like Twitch was like, hey, we'll pay you to have this as like a Twitch thing. And Xbox is like, sure, I guess. Sure. Because uh, sure. like the, the ones Xbox themselves have produced have flown by and been really good. So this is weird. But I want to give a shout out to Trisha Hirschberger. Uh, I've been a fan of her since she was with SourceFed back in the day. Really good host. Um, you know, glad to see her get her shine there on a good stage. Uh, I want to give some shout outs real quick. Uh, obviously 12 minutes we didn't talk about that because like that's already known quantity like we're gonna play 12 minutes come on now uh last stop which you mentioned astria ascending or yeah astria ascending which is from a lot of former final uh fantasy and your automata devs looks really cool for those interested in the art style and jrpgs we got loot river which is a pixel looks like a a um a roguelike featuring a plague doctor character we didn't get too much on that kind of one of the ones like the uh Mean Streets Gamer was like up for 30 seconds and gone. Not a whole lot there. Uh, what else here? Uh, Demon Turf, which is a colorful, cartoony 3D platformer. Uh, Narita Boy, which is launching a Game Pass on March 30th, which is relatively soon. That's like a, a vaporware 2D game. Grifflands, which is a card game mixed with turn-based combat. We got Little Witch in the Woods, which I think is adorably cute. That's one of the games I'm looking forward to launching the Game Pass as well. The Ascent, a twin-stick shooter that was shown at the Xbox uh, unveiling for the Xbox Series X. Omino, which is another 3D platformer with a unique art style. Uh, the Big Con, which is another game with a unique art style. All of these games, I highly suggest, instead of going to watch the presentation, like Chris and I said, wasn't very good to watch through live. Go to the ID at Xbox channel, go to IGN's channel, check out the trailers for the games we mentioned. Totally worth it not worth it to go and watch that presentation we did so you don't have to uh but like i said a ton of cool games to check out that being said we talked about the presentation let's talk about what we've been playing i don't have a lot this week to talk about chris the only thing i wanted to mention is i've been playing a lot more of loop hero which i talked about quite extensively on the show last week so i don't need to go into that again are you familiar with loop Hero at all uh, i am yeah so kind of a hard game to describe on a podcast i tried my best last week uh, really enjoying that game. The funny thing with it is I've watched some people play it and it's one of those games where just depending on your loot drops, you could beat the first boss in your first playthrough or you could not beat it until your 10th run of a loop. I'm on like my 14th loop that I've done. Haven't come close to defeating the boss, but the cool thing with that game is that's not all there is to it. Like I'm gathering materials. I'm upgrading my village. I am seeing progress in major ways. So I'm not feeling like I've hit a brick wall or anything like that. Um, in that way, it's really well designed in which you're constantly making progress no matter what in one way or another, which is super satisfying. And if those type of games aren't designed correctly, these roguelikes, that's a breaking point. That's a wall for people, right? The moment you're not seeing progress, why am I continuing to run into this wall over and over again for no point? So I'm, sure. I'm glad they designed it that way. It's going to be in talks for game of the year by the end of the year. I'm barely scratched the service, even though I've played like, I think six to seven hours already having a blast with that. Other than that, I've been dabbling with Minecraft here and there. I got back into it a couple of weeks ago, Chris, after not playing it for maybe a couple of years. And for me, it's, that's just like a, a serene podcast, chill out game. Like I don't find any stress in that game. I just go in there. I, you know, mine, I build, I just do my thing. It's very cathartic in that way for me. Um, and especially in the last year and a half, I think people could use some catharsis in one way or another. So finding sure. comfort in that is really good. Um, and just, you know, dropping into the war zone in Call of Duty, as I do from time to time. And yeah, having a blast there. A lot of indie games coming out, a lot of uh, Game Pass games I want to dive into. Especially with the amount of AAA delays we're getting this year, I think it's a good time to tackle the backlog in Game Pass, which I don't mind. So I'll have more to say on those type of games moving forward. Uh, for you, though, anything of note that you've played recently? Uh, the only game that I've really played over the last week is Minecraft Dungeons with my son. And yeah. uh, we ho we hopped in as like one of those. We don't know what to play. He looked at Game Pass. It was free. We downloaded it. And then we were two hours later, we were in the Minecraft Dungeons and like super excited. <laughs> and I've never I'll be honest, I, I've never played Minecraft like just hasn't interested me whatsoever. He's played Minecraft. But like 
it was cool because I was able to transition in a, in like a top down to be able to understand what was going on. And then he was explaining to me why each of these things that we were getting mattered. Yeah. And as we're progressing through, it was just like really cool. And he's like, Oh, this is this thing because he knows it for Minecraft. I don't know what it is. I'm like, okay, well get the purple thing that keeps turning into other purple things. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? I'm like, yeah. so, but he, like he's saying, that's a witch. That's this, that's that. And I'm like, okay, but it was, I, we had a blast. I, we had a, a bunch of fun. And then, um, we're reviving each other and, and stuff. I, I just had a really good time. Uh, it was a cool dungeon crawler. Like it, uh, it's, it's pretty, it's meant for kids, but that, that, that's cool. Yeah. Like, uh, we had a, we had a really good time with it. It's awesome. Like I, on a, like a more personal subject, I, I don't know if I'm going to have kids, right? That's something that I've debated whether or not I'm going to eventually have kids. But one of the coolest things about knowing people and having friends that have kids is hearing about those experiences because, you know. I remember playing video games with my parents when I was a kid, and those are some of the best moments growing up. And to be able to connect in that way, and it's cool that it's such a unique experience for you, where you're you've been gaming much longer than he has, but you have this completely blank space in terms of knowledge of a game, and he's introducing you to the concepts of it in this kind of middle path where both of you meet in this game. That is really cool. Uh, I love Minecraft Dungeons because I, we talked about this in our uh, in our Discord. Minecraft Dungeons is to du dungeon crawlers what Pokemon is to like role playing games and specifically Japanese role playing games and turn based role playing games, and I think that's really cool because you know when your when your kid gets older there might come a point when like Diablo six or whatever it's going to be comes out or some type of dungeon crawler comes out and he has that familiarity with the genre of Minecraft Dungeons and maybe he gets lured into that because of that right it has those foundations to get him into the genre and I think that's super dope. But at the end of the day, it's awesome to be able to play a game with your kid and have a good time. And, you know, not every game needs to be complicated. Like, it's fine that games are for kids. It's just like when people complain about animated shows or movies, uh, you know, being for kids, it's like, yeah, it's the audience, man. It's not for you. It's completely fine. And, you know what I mean? That's how it is. It's cool to hear the you play cool, Minecraft Dungeons. The other cool game we've been uh, dabbling into is Rocket League. And that's oh, because cool. he's into soccer and his friends have it on Nintendo. And he has it on, well, he has it on Nintendo, but he can play with them because of, you know, play anywhere. He can play on Xbox and still play with them. Yeah. So they're competing cross-platform and, and just having a blast playing together. And it's like one of those things where I'm like, I don't play Rocket League, but now I'm watching Rocket League. And, <laughs> and he played he played against me and he kicked my ass up and down. I'm like, I thought, I'm like, oh, I, I'll be able to do this. No, not even close. Like, I didn't know you had a boost. I didn't know how to turn the, the vehicle. The car kept spinning around and was, like, going in different directions. I'm like, that's not the direction I meant it to go. And he's just, like, just destroying me. Like, he's pulling moves like you'd see on Twitch. It's like, this is dumb. <laughs> I'm like, I'm getting killed by a 10-year-old. So, um, but, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Like, uh, so those are the two games that I've really been playing. Only because, like, nothing's really caught my fancy. Like, I finished up AC Valhalla and put almost 140 hours into that game. And I just have had a lull where it's like, I just don't know what I want to play. And I don't really want to start anything yet. Uh, but I'm getting this. T it takes two this weekend uh, to play with my wife. So I'm going to be excited about playing that and kind of diving into something that she and I can play together. Did you play Brothers or uh, what was the second game? The, the heck is it called? No Way Out. Did you play either of those games? Uh, no Way Out. Yes. Yes. I did play that. Uh, I played it with a friend of mine. Uh, he had purchased it and lived. Gosh, he lived in Utah and I'm here. And we played through the entire through the entire game, like, and it was pretty awesome. Like, I only played it once. We did it through that pass. Um, he had purchased it and was like, "Hey, I purchased it. You down to play?" I'm like, "Sure." And it, I think we did it over like two or three nights, just because, like, I, like I can't do more than like a couple of hours on that type of like, because there's no talking. We're not really allowed to talk because you're listening to the commentary. Like, you can talk. Like, I'm over here, but it wasn't really more. It wasn't like a together type game, yeah. more so like you just did your own thing and they did their own thing and it kind of worked together. Whereas from listening to all the talk about It Takes Two, it's more of a combination of you having to have some, a partner sitting right there or at least have a com some version of communication in order to get things accomplished. So Brothers is, I think currently, my list is always changing, but I, I the type of person I am, I have my own like list of my 100 favorite games of all time. Ryan's constantly changing, moving things around. But Brothers, The Tale of Two Sons is really cool because you probably already know this. It's a co-op game, but it's a co-op between your two thumbs. You control one brother with the left analog stick and the other brother with the right analog stick. And it's a puzzle game. Uh, and it's really good. It's pretty short as well. Uh, it was Joseph Ferris's first game, Hazelight's first game. And it's really cool to see how they've evolved from that 
to No Way Out or A Way Out, whatever that game's called, and then yep. to uh, It Takes Two. And it seems like It Takes Two in terms of critical reception is doing really well. We joked about none of us picked it up in our fantasy league, and I think it's in like an 86 or 87 on Metacritic. It reviewed very well. Uh, and anybody out there, I highly suggest checking out Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons. Really cool, fantastical story of these two brothers who uh, their father becomes sick and they have to go and get him medicine. And I kind of want to explain it as simply as that for uh, avoiding spoiler sake. But yeah, really good studio. I'm glad to see they're getting some shine. And I'm interested to see uh, you know, what kind of time you and your wife have playing through that because it seems like a really good game. Um, Talk about a studio that like literally has found its niche. Yeah, exactly. Like that that's the niche. So like you got to carve your way out someplace and, and then they have uh, one thing I wanted to mention about Rocket League real quick, as you talked about watching your son play it is the fascinating thing about Rocket League is I play it quite often. I love that game. It's one of the sports titles like multiplayer games where you can visually see your friends getting better at the game. Cause the big difference in that game is people start off and they start, you know, figuring out how to you know work with the camera and not get dizzy or anything like that. And they focus on, being able to hit the ball and then you get better at, okay, when the ball bounces off the wall, learning how to hit it and direct it towards the goal. Right. And then you get better at actually taking shots at the goal and you're seeing these levels of progression. And the biggest moment in jump in terms of skill is when you transition from being, from being solely on the ground as a player to being able to jump up and use your boost to navigate through the air and hit the ball midair. And the moment you see your friends do that for the first time, it's kind of a proud dad moment, you know, like seeing your kid ride his bike uh, you're like, hell yeah, you got it. And in terms of competitiveness, it helps because then you finally have somebody else who can competitively fight other teams who have players like that because it's a huge advantage to have players on your team that can do aerial moves. So it's really cool yep. to see that skill evolve with your friends over time because I had, I had friends who hopped into Rocket League for the first time at the end of last year, beginning of this year, never played it before, and they slowly got better and better. And it's really cool to see that visual progression of their skills in real time. Really neat. Um, I think that's it for this week's show. Uh, before I give the rigmarole for controlled interest, Chris, as always, thank you for joining me. If you can, please let the people know where they can find you on the internet. I'm always on Twitter at Toe for Noons. Awesome. If you guys want to listen to us on Spotify, Google Play, uh, Apple Podcasts, we're on all of the networks. Uh, just search controlled interest will pop right up. Speaking of searching controlled interest, you can do the same on YouTube. Our YouTube channel will be there. Hit the bell notification so you know when we upload new videos. Like the podcast if you like the video comment letting me know what you think of what we talked about today uh tell me and chris what game you enjoyed seeing at the idea at xbox showcase if you watched it or maybe watch the trailers after on twitter you can follow me personally at jared weich that's j-e-r-r-a-d-w-y-c-h-e and collectively we are c-t-r-l-i-n-t that's controlled interest abbreviated dom who was in here this week you can find him at dom's oreos other than that uh we have an instagram now where i just post the latest episode if that's your preferred social media over twitter uh, if you're like Chrissy Teigen and Twitter might not be for you, perfectly fine. You can go on over to Instagram. I, uh, upload, uh, whenever we have the new podcast, you can get it there as well. And if any of that's too complicated, just simply go to controlledinterest.com. It'll pop right up. You'll see the podcast feed. That being said, thank you once again, Chris, for joining me. It's always a pleasure to talk video games with you and, uh, we'll see what happens in the coming weeks with all of these video game delays, announcements, who knows what's going to happen. See you guys then.